everybody, welcome to the vineyard. My name is Julie and we wanna make sure you know about a couple of things that are happening soon that you might want to be part of. So first of all, next Sunday, September 12th, we're gonna be having baptisms during both services and we'd love for you to join us to celebrate with those who are gonna be baptized. Also, life groups are starting soon, so if you don't have a group that you're currently meeting with, I wanna encourage you to consider this. There are quite a few groups that still have space and to take a look at what's available, you can go to the website, vineyardwheeling.com, follow the links for groups on the main page and sign up there. And if you wanna sign up to be baptized, you can also sign up on the website for that. Well, we're gonna to start today with some worship music and then hear the message from Pastor Chris.
Well, hey, folks, welcome back to the story of Jesus. If you're new with us, we're going through the book of Mark, and we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32 today. So if you have a Bible or you have a Bible on your phone or device, go ahead and open to that. But I want to ask you a question to start out. Have you ever thought you had something figured out? You knew exactly the way things were, but then you found out you were wrong about it. Anybody? Any, anyone? Um, last Friday, my wife woke me up at uh, uh, early in the morning. Uh, I was sound asleep. I mean, dead asleep. I, I didn't sleep well that evening. And she came in in kind of a panic and said, Gus, who's our dog, Gus has this huge cut on his shoulder. And so I got up and I rushed down. I put on my glasses. I'm still a little bleary eyed. And sure enough, he's got this patch on his shoulder where, where uh, and as I looked at it, it, I swear, it looked like he had an open gash in his shoulder, like he had a piece of barbed wire or something. It was about an inch long, kind of gaping, and you could look in and see the muscle. And I was like, not, not a lot of blood, but, you know, that happens sometimes. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, yeah, we can't leave this for the weekend. We're going to have to get him taken care of. So at 8 o'clock, I call our veterinarian, and they have a message on their uh, machine saying that they're all out with COVID and they won't be in for the week, th th that week. So now I've got a problem on my hands. They say, you know, take your dog to Pittsburgh to an urgent dog or urgent care where they'll charge you $1,000 to fix your dog. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do that, or at least I don't want to do that. So I start calling vets, and everybody is either out of town or booked up. Nobody has space. I finally find a vet who says, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at him and we'll fix him up. But it's because he's not one of our patients, it's $200 just to have him looked at. And then whatever we charge on top of that to fix the problem. And, I'm, and they're like, and we're going to have to knock him out and do all this. Other. I'm like, oh, this is going to be outrageously expensive. So but I can't leave the dog with a gaping wound for the weekend. So I load him up and I take him down to the veterinarian's office and we get into the veterinarian's office and we sit down. We're back in the, in the room where the exam room, I guess, is what you'd call it. And we're sitting there and we're waiting. And I said, you know, Gus, come here a second. I want to take another look at this, this, this wound. And so he comes over and I move the fur away. And there's not a gaping wound there. It's actually what he had was a raspberry, like all the fur was scraped away and, and, you know, kind of an abrasion, but it wasn't a gaping wound. We had no reason to be at the veterinarian's office. Uh, and I'm like, oh, this is going to cost me a fortune just for a rat, you know, I mean, but I was absolutely certain. I spent an hour and a half finding a veterinarian who could take care of my dog because I was sure he had a gaping wound. Of course, I was all bleary eyed when I, when I, um, when I came down, but I was positive of what I had seen. And so I went off and, and, and was fixing the problem, right? Now, I immediately got up and took the dog out to the waiting room, and the lady who was coming in to see us walked out and said, oh, there you are, you're not back in the room. And I'm like, I explained the situation to her, and she was like, yeah, go on, get out of here. And they didn't charge us, so that was exciting. Uh, and, Gus is, and Gus is healing, in case you're worried about the dog. He's, he, we're taking care of the wound, and he's healing nicely. But have you ever had that happen? You know, like you were sure what you saw, you were sure of what, the, of the way things were, and then later on you find out you were wrong? In, in Mark, Mark is addressing some of that with the disciples. He's addressing some of that with the, the uh, people that he's writing to. If you remember, Mark is writing to a Roman uh, audience. So the Romans were a little different than the Jews. They were a lot different than the Jews. Uh, very similar culture to ours. They were very proud people, very self-sufficient, uh, very ambitious for money and power and status and pleasure and, and position, kind of, kind of like our culture. Now the Jewish culture had some similar, uh, similar traits, but not exactly the same. Uh, but the thing that was the same for both the Jewish, uh, a Jewish audience and for the disciples and for this Roman audience that, that uh, Mark is writing to is, is simply this. They had no place for a crucified king. Kings were people who were exalted. They were powerful. They had um, prestige and position, and they had people who served them, and, and they, kings did not suffer. 
Uh, a, a crucified king would be an oxymoron in their minds. A, a leader who was a suffering servant, not even a possibility, right? And this is why the disciples have such a hard time getting their minds around the fact that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to suffer and die. And he tells them this over and over again because it's a blind spot for them. They can't see it through the lens of their theology, the lens of their culture. They think they see what what God is up to looking through the lens that they have. And Jesus is plainly telling them what God is up to, and they're not seeing it because they're, they're blinded. They've got a blind spot. Now, Mark is, is, com- is communicating some very specific themes. Um, and we've hit some of these themes over and over again. And to do that, he's not necessarily writing the story in chronological order. This is not a typical for the time, the style of writing uh, in, in the first century, it would not be atypical to tell the story, but put it in a chronological order, put it in an order that helps support whatever point you were making. Now, Luke, the, the gospel of Luke's a little different. That's more of a chronological account of what Jesus went through. And Luke set out to give a step-by-step, this is what happened, and then this happened, and this happened. In Mark, it's the same stories, they're just in, in, a, in a bit of a different order, and he is reinforcing a point. Now, one of the things that you will see through the book of Mark is Jesus heals blind guys. There's a lot of blind people that show up. And uh, in, Luke, or in, in Mark chapter 8, if you remember back to then, there was a blind guy that showed up and asked Jesus to heal him, and Jesus takes him aside and spits in his eyes. You remember that? And he spits in his eyes, and he says, so can you see? And the guy's like, well, I can sort of see. I, I, I can see people, but they look like trees moving around. It's the only partial healing that we see in, in all of the Gospels. And, and so Jesus prays for him again, and the guy can see completely, right? So it's like he kind of gets his sight, and then he gets all of his sight. But then Mark goes into uh, these accounts with the disciples, these these uh, the, these events that happen with the disciples that kind of illustrate a spiritual blindness. And you see how he puts this together to, to, um, to emphasize that. Um, so after he heals the, the blind man in Bethsaida, uh, he pulls the disciples aside and says, who do, you, who do people say I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter's like, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, oh, you see, Peter, you can see. You know, you can't see this because of, of your own wisdom or anything. God has revealed this to you. You're absolutely right. And then Jesus is go, reveals some of the plan to him. And he goes, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going back down to Jerusalem, and they're going to kill me. But don't worry, on the third day, I'm going to, to rise again. And Peter's like, whoa, Jesus. That's not what's going to happen. That can't happen to you. Remember, you're the king. You're the Messiah. See, their perception of the Messiah was the deliverer. And and they looked at Jesus through the lens of the day and age that they lived in. We do this too, but they were doing this. They, They said, okay, so we are occupied by Rome. We need to be delivered from Rome. So you're going to come in as a military conqueror, and you're going to deliver us from Rome. That's what the Messiah is going to do. They were looking through that lens. And Jesus says what at that point? He says, get behind me, Satan. See, uh, Peter could see, but he could only kind of see in part, right? He was kind of like people like trees moving around. He, there, was, there were some blind spots that Peter had, and the rest of the disciples had it as, as well. And then Jesus pulls him aside and goes, you know, I, I know you, you think that leaders are supposed to be great, but in my kingdom, leaders are supposed to serve. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And in other words, you guys, quit defaulting to what you think you know and listen to what I'm telling you. Deny yourself, humble yourself, and follow me. And then... In Mark 9, Jesus takes Peter, um, 
James and John up onto the mountain, and Jesus uh, turns into lightning boy. He's got lightning shooting out. You know, he's just bright white, and this, you know, they see the glory of Jesus, and Moses and Elijah show up, and Peter's like, now we're talking. With this kind of glory, we can take over everything. We can kick the Romans out. This is going to be awesome. And immediately God shuts the whole thing down and says, listen to my son. Listen to my son. Listen to what he's telling you. They, they're, they're still kind of blinded to it. They, they're confused. They don't understand what Jesus is saying when he plainly tells them what is about to happen. Then they come down off the mountain, and there's a guy with a son who's demon-possessed, and, and the disciples can't do anything about it, and they're having a hard time, and, and Jesus shows up, and the guy's like, well, if you can do something about it, and Jesus is like, if I can, I can do anything for, for those who believe, and the guy's like, well... I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. I can see, but help me overcome what I can't see. You know, there, there, there's a, a certain amount of blindness, and there's a humility to this guy. Like, he understands that he, he doesn't believe as much as he could, that he doesn't see as much as he could. Then in, in uh, Mark 9, verse 30, Jesus predicts his death a second time. He gives them the details, and they're, they're still like wondering, what does that mean? I, I don't know. I don't understand. And, 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 and it's a blind spot for them. They just can't see it. And then he tells them, look, if, if, if you want to be great in my kingdom, this is one of the themes that Mark hits, and this is one of the cultural blind spots for them. If you want to be great, make yourself last. Make yourself like a child. And as we discussed in previous week, children were, were kind of at the very bottom of the, the social totem pole. They were not valued like they are in today's culture. Uh, they were dependent. They didn't have everything figured out. He said, you want to be great, make yourself like a child. Then the disciples started protecting their turf, and they're like, it's all about us, and it's about our fame and our control. And Jesus is like, cut that out. Another blind spot for them. And then he says, you got to become like a child again. You don't have everything figured out, guys. You've got blind spots. And then the rich young ruler showed up. We talked about this last week. The rich young ruler showed up with a hole in his heart. He was doing all the right religious things, but knew something was missing. And he comes to Jesus, and Jesus puts his finger on his blind spot which was that he loved his money more than he loved God. He loved his power and his position more than he loved God, and he wasn't willing to put God first above that. He was blind. Well, this week we're going to pick up in verse 32 of Mark chapter 10, and this is what it says. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. The disciples were astonished, I think, because they know Jesus is going into a very dangerous situation, right? He's walking boldly into Jerusalem. The, the a fervor against Jesus among the religious leaders is at a fever pitch. They are, they are determined to take him out to kill him. And the disciples know this, and Jesus is just walking in with full confidence and full boldness into doing it. And they're astonished by his, his bravery, I would guess, and everybody else is afraid because what's going to happen to him? And it says again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. So this is the third time, guys. This is the third time Jesus is, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die. But he gives even more detail this time. He says, and the Son of Man, that's how he refers to himself, will be delivered over to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. In other words, the Jewish leaders are going to take me, and, they, and they're going to condemn him to death. They're going to condemn me to death and hand me over to the Gentiles because only the Romans, because the Romans occupied this part of the world, they were the only ones that were allowed to administer the death penalty. And so he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles, and they're going to mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him, and three days later, he will rise. They still don't understand. You know how I know they don't understand? Because they were not waiting at the tomb on Easter morning. 
They were hiding on Easter morning. They were terrified. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying the third time. Guys, this is a huge blind spot for these guys. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this gives me a great deal of comfort for this reason. I've got blind spots. And we watch as Jesus continues to to walk with them, continues to teach them, continues to help them get their arms around this, and he doesn't give up on them. I mean, these are the guys that go on to lead the movement later, right? And he does the same thing with us. What Jesus did then he, with people is what he does now with people. And, and, you know, guys, we're not always going to be 100% correct. We're not always going to see the whole picture But Jesus doesn't give up on us. He walks with us. He continues to teach us and continues to help us see. And I find great comfort in that. But for the disciples, you know, going and being crucified, this is not what great leaders do. They they have no place to put this. They can't even begin to see what he's talking about. Well, in verse 35, then, James and John come to Jesus, they're the sons of Zebedee, and they come to him and they say this, they say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Isn't that how we come to Jesus? (laughs) Jesus, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, I want you to do, you know, whatever it is we want Jesus to do, that's how we come to him, whatever we ask, even though we don't see the big picture. And sometimes this is why our prayers are not answered the way we want them to be answered, because Jesus knows that we're not seeing the big picture. Well, these guys come to him, they ask for, for, they ask him to do whatever they ask, and, and then he plays along with them. He says, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. They're convinced Jesus is going into Jerusalem, they're going to defeat the Romans, he's going to become king, they want to be his number one and number two guys. They want to be, you know, kind of rule the court, so to speak. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Jesus clearly understands he's going in to suffer and die. And he says, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? In other words, can you can you handle the suffering? Can you handle the the persecution and even the martyrdom that I'm about to to, uh, undertake? They don't know what they're asking. They say in verse 39, we can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, oh, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. And what he's saying is eventually you are going to suffer and, and die for the faith. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand, that's not for, for me to grant These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. God, the Father, gets to decide that. Remember, this is a theme that comes up over and over again. They're they're vying to be the greatest. They're vying for position and all of that. Well, the the rest of the disciples catch wind that James, James and John had this conversation with Jesus. And it says, when the ten heard about this, they became very indignant because they didn't get to ask first. They wanted to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. Well, Jesus calls them all together and says the same thing that he has said several times now, but they have not yet gotten their arms around because it's a blind spot for them. Jesus calls them together and says, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. It is about position and power and authority. It's not so with you, though. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. I I, I don't know how many times Jesus hits this through the Gospels. I haven't counted, but he hits it over and over and over again. Why? Because they can't get their heads around it. They are blind to this paradigm of leadership. The paradigm they're living under is the, the paradigm of their world, the paradigm of their leaders, the paradigm of the Roman culture, the Jewish culture. This is Nobody even questions this. This is just the way it is. Leadership is about position and authority and power and fame and all those things, and that's what they want. And Jesus is like, stop pursuing that and start serving people, but they still 
don't get it. Not so with you, he says. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, even I, Jesus is saying, did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. He came, stepped out of heaven, became a human being, which was a huge act of humility on his part to serve us, to die for us ultimately, the ultimate act of service. Another blind spot. And then in verse 46, we come to a real blind guy again. And Jesus is entering into the city of Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. And, uh, and as he's leaving Jericho, we'll pick up there. As Jesus and his disciples, um, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus. It's, it's interesting. Uh, again, Mark, just kind of the Roman audience he's writing to, wouldn't have underst- understood that Bartimaeus meant son of Timaeus. But, so he, he gives clarification there. And he says was, he was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they're like, all right. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you, Throw, throwing his cloak aside. He jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. What a silly question for a blind guy, right? I mean, what do you want me to do for you? Well, I could use a new cloak. You know, I, I mean, my, 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 I, I don't get new clothes that often. Maybe you could get me, a, or, you know, I, I need a house. Or, boy, if you could make it so that I could win the publisher's clearinghouse, you know, $5,000 a week for life thing, that would be fantastic because then I didn't have to, then I won't have to beg on the, no! He wanted to see. He wanted his sight back. There's, he knew that he was blind, and he knew that he, he knew what his need was, and he knew what his blind spot was. Everything he couldn't see, he knew what to ask Jesus for. I want to see. In verse 52, Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight, and he followed Jesus along the road. See, Bartimaeus, he knew he was blind. There was no question about what he he needed or wanted. And so there was no hesitation about what to ask for. You know, I think of of Matthew back in chapter 2 of Mark. We hear the, the, the calling of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. And uh, tax collectors were, were hated in their culture because they had betrayed their countrymen to serve the Romans and collect taxes from their people, their own people, and give it to the Roman government and enrich themselves in the process. They were traitors, and they were considered the worst of sinners. And so Jesus walks up to a tax booth. There's a guy there named Matthew, one of the worst of the worst sinners in, in the town of Capernaum. He walks up to Matthew, and he says, hey, follow me, scandalous. You know, how, how can a tax collector follow a rabbi? A rabbi shouldn't even talk to a tax collector. And later that evening, they're having a party at Matthew's house, and Matthew invited all of his tax collector and sinner friends, and they're all hanging out, having a party at Matthew's house with Jesus, and he's hanging out with them and talking to them and, spe- and being their friends. I think the disciples were probably a little bent out of shape about the fact that Jesus is hanging out with a tax collector and all these sinners. Certainly the religious leaders were. They were worked up over it, and they started asking his disciples, what's he doing hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? That's not right for a rabbi to do that. And Jesus Jesus answers back. He says, on, on hearing that, Jesus said to them, it's not the the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. It's, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, what Jesus is saying here is, it's not the people who think they have it all together that I've come for. I've come for the people who know they don't. It's not the people who think they're righteous, 
but the people who know they're not. None are righteous. We, we know that. But these religious people had become self-righteous, and they couldn't even see the fact that they needed a spiritual Savior because they had a blind spot to their own sinfulness and their own problems because they were better than everybody else. I mean, they could look around and keep more of the rules than everybody else. See, I think full-blown heathens have an advantage when it comes to meeting Jesus because when they meet Jesus, they know they're sinners. They know they need a Savior. They know they need community. They know they need to follow Jesus and do what he says because they don't have a prayer on their own and they're fully in touch with that. But us longtime church people... Guys, there is a temptation for us to become like Pharisees. There's a temptation for us to get puffed up with pride because we have some knowledge, because we think we have it figured out. And we're, we're, we're the ones that will argue the finer theological points of, you know, the end times or, or uh, you know, predestination versus free will or whatever else. And we will dig in and argue and we will tear apart somebody else because we think we've got it all figured out. In reality, we're just kind of blind to our own need for a savior and we're puffed up with pride on what we think we know. We treat Jesus like he's an enhancement to our lives. He's here to comfort me when I need it, prosper me, provide for me. And he does comfort us and he does He will bless us and he will provide for us all of those things, but that's not his purpose and that's not his point. And the reality is, if we're asking him to do that from a position of pride, he he doesn't play that game. As we learned last week, Jesus will not be part of your great thing. He is inviting you to sacrifice your great thing and be part of his great thing, be part of his kingdom. You know, back in the, the uh, early 90s, I felt like God gave me a vision for a ministry, and I dedicated my life to it. I, I came back, spent six years of my life working on this ministry, eating ramen noodles and living in my parents' attic, trying to build this ministry. And in reality, I got to pick a part of the picture, and then I tried to build the rest of it on my own what I thought I knew. There were some blind spots that I had along the way. Now, the good news is God used all of that to get me where I needed to be. He walked with me. He eventually gave me eyes to see, and I learned some humility along the way as well. It's a painful lesson, but that's what we do. See, we think we see in fullness when really a lot of times we only see in part, but then in our pride and arrogance, we try and build in the difference. Kind of like when I looked at the the cut on Gus's shoulder and I thought I saw what I saw and I filled my mind, filled in the blanks to the rest of it. Guys, the point is simply this. We see in part. We see in part. And there are things in this life that we're not going to be able to see or understand or we're not going to be able to see and understand them until God reveals them to us. And he commands us, Jesus, over and over again for his disciples on their spiritual blindness. He commands us to humble ourselves, to go to the end of the line, to not puff ourselves up, to embrace the fact that we cannot see and call out for help and for healing, to embrace the fact that We need help with our unbelief. You know, how often do Christians try and gin up faith? You know, it's like, well, you know, I need a healing or I need this. Well, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. God, you know, I got, and he's going to do it. And and we kind of hype ourselves up to, and it's like, I do believe, help me with my unbelief. Because I've got some doubts. If you're honest with yourself, everybody has some doubts. Lord, help me with my unbelief. Help me to see what I, I don't see. Help me to see, not just in my mind, but in here, that I need a Savior, that I'm blind. I'm blind, let me see. I'm sick, heal me. I'm a sinner. Forgive me again today. Those are the prayers that Jesus answers over and over again. It's when we think we can see. It's when we think that we're not sick. It's when we think we have it all together or all figured out. 
that we continue to mutter on in the darkness. So the question is practical. Let's get down to the practical side of this. How how do you know when you have a spiritual blind spot? A couple things here. First, you have a sense that you do. I call that sense the Holy Spirit. He starts whispering in your your heart that there's a blind spot here. Now, are you humble enough to listen to his voice and be open enough to the fact that you don't have it all figured out? A lot of times this will happen for me as I'm reading Scripture, and he will highlight a Scripture, and it will hit my heart like a ton of bricks. And I'm like, oh, that's right. But is my heart soft enough? Am I... Is my heart humble enough to accept that, or will I push through and continue to pretend like I got it all figured out when really I'm just looking through my broken lens? Sometimes it will happen where a theme will show up over and over again. I'll be talking to to other people, or I'll see it wherever I look, and it's like, oh, and he'll begin to illuminate the fact that I've got a blind spot there. Sometimes it's when when I start living for this world. You know, I start pursuing the things of this world over his agenda, and I know that I've got a blind spot at that point. Or when I get too important in my own eyes, and I start to think I'm smarter than I am, or that I'm better than I am. You know, the other way that you can know that you have a spiritual blind spot is when someone tells you you do. And you're like, well, you know, people... People aren't nice. I'm like, well, when the people you love and the people who know you are willing to point something out in your life, they've probably wrestled with that for a while before they actually have the conversation because those are hard conversations to have. And they have those conversations because they love you, because they care about you. Guys, this is why every follower of Jesus needs a community of other Jesus followers around them. It's why we need a group of Christian friends. This is why we emphasize so much life groups in the vineyard. Because if you're not doing life, I mean, not just like, hey, I have a Christian friend that I check in with every once in a while, but it's people that you are walking with on a regular basis, a weekly basis who know you, who know what's going on in your life, who know uh, what you're struggling with and what's going on and, and care about you, who are willing to speak honestly into your life, you're going to have more blind spots than you need. Jesus purposely pulled together 12 guys as his inner circle to demonstrate this for us. And he, and he spoke into their blind spots and he helped them to see. And guys, we have to do that for one another. If you're not walking in Christian community, and I don't mean just coming to church on Sunday, but if you don't have a group of other Christians you're walking with, you're going to walk through this life with blind spots you don't necessarily need to. Because it's one of the prime ways God points out in our lives where we're missing it and helps us grow. And it is beautiful. It is beautiful. Now, we're starting life groups here in just a couple weeks. And in fact, signups for life groups start today. So make sure you get a catalog, find a group if you're not in one. If you're in one or you got a group of people you're getting together with regularly, that's great. But if you don't get into a group, it's essential for your spiritual growth. All right, wrapping up. What is the cure for spiritual blindness? I've got four things here. First thing is this. You can write this down. Admit that you have blind spots. Admit it. Humble yourself and admit that you don't have everything figured out. It's okay. There's, I know... I know Christians and have walked with Christians over the years who, you know, that's kind of their shtick. You know, they've got it all figured out. They'll argue any theological point and they're miserable to be around. Don't be that person. Admit that you don't necessarily have it all figured out. Admit that you can see, but you can't see everything. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, The Apostle Paul captures this beautifully. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote half the New Testament. So if it's true for him, 
It's probably true for you as well. He, he was addressing the church in Corinth, and there was a lot of pride in the church in Corinth, especially around the issue of spiritual gifts. And in chapter 13, he takes it head on. He goes, you know, if you can, if you can speak in, in the tongues of angels and you can sell everything you have and you can fathom all the mysteries of Scripture and you can argue this and you can do that, and, but you don't have love, you got nothing. Like those other things don't matter at all because you only know what you're doing there in part. You don't see it all very as clearly as, as it is. You certainly don't. And if you're going to err, err on the side of love, err on the side of grace, err on the side of compassion, because that's what it all comes down to. And then at the end, he makes it very clear. In verse 12, he says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. We only see in part. Then we're going to see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Walk humbly enough to admit that you have blind spots. Second part of the cure is this, surrender to Jesus. If you missed last week's message, go back and watch last week's message. It will help you with this. That's what the whole message was about, but ultimately, As we're humble and we admit we have blind spots, one of the things Jesus is going to do is put his finger on the one thing in your life that you value above him. And he is going to work with you and challenge you to surrender that to him. Third thing is this. Feed your spirit. Feed your spirit. How do we do this? We read the word of God. We pray. That's how God speaks to us in prayer and through reading His Word. And the third, third way is by being in intentional community with other Christians. That is the pathway to spiritual growth. That is the pathway to spiritual development. That is how God illuminates our blind spots and helps us take our next steps. Again, we've got groups starting here in just a couple weeks. Sign up for one and become a part of a group of people who can help you grow. Fourth thing is this, get people around you who can help you. Again, life group signups, but you gotta have people around you who can speak into your life and help you see the things that you don't see. Guys, in this life, there are going to be things that we see clearly And there are going to be things that we miss completely. There are going to be times when we're sure we saw what we saw, and it's going to turn out to be something different. And there are going to be times when we're just sure we saw what we saw, and it is what it is. I'm not saying there's no truth, so please don't hear me saying that. What I am saying is if you will walk humbly with God, and you will call out to Him and say, I can't see Help me see. He will help you see. I am sick. Heal me. He will bring healing to your soul. And you will grow. But if we dig in and demand that we've got it all figured out, there's not a lot he can do with that. And we end up like the disciples, getting the same lesson over and over and over and over again until they had to walk through a great deal of pain to actually get their heads around what was going on. And the good news is that Jesus isn't giving up on you, and he's not mad at you. But you can cooperate with your own healing when you humble yourself. And there's some of us here today, your next step in following Jesus, maybe you've been coming to church for a while and checking Jesus out, but you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, and your next step is that surrender. Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want to follow you. I am blind, and I want to see. And for some of us, you've been in church maybe your entire life, and maybe you don't even see your blind spots yet. And I think for those who are in that boat, that's me, I grew up in the church, our prayer needs to be, Jesus, I confess that I don't see it all. I confess that I've been living according to my lenses and my agenda, would you help me to see? I'm blind.
I want to see. Let's make that our prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that you would give us the eyes to see. I pray for those of us who are, are walking uh, in our own agenda, Lord, who are inviting you to make our stuff great, who think we have it all figured out, Lord. Who are, Would you give us the eyes to see our blindness? And Lord, would you heal us of that blindness? God, I pray that we would walk in step with you. I pray, God, that, that as your followers, Lord, we would understand what it means to, to pick up our cross and, and, and follow you and surrender all to you and to be healed by you. And Lord, for those who are new, God, I pray that they would experience what it is to receive sight for the first time. As in, in the, the song Amazing Grace, I once was blind, but, but now I see. I pray that over us as a people. In Jesus' name, amen. In both of the interactions of Jesus that Chris shared about today, we hear Jesus ask the same question. In verse 36 and then in verse 51, Jesus says, What do you want me to do for you? And in both cases, the people responded with exactly what they wanted. But Jesus' replies were different. To the disciples, his answer basically revealed that they didn't really know what they were asking for. They were blind to what it really meant to drink the cup that Jesus would drink or take the baptism that Jesus would take. Yet the blind man was of course aware that he was blind and so he knew he needed to ask to be able to see. You know, maybe one part of having these stories together is a way of Jesus saying something to his disciples and to us. Maybe his point was that when we ask for things from God, we should also ask to be able to see from his point of view what it would mean to get what we want. And so maybe as we go to God in prayer, we first ask him to remove any blindness we may have about the situation and then trust that he will answer in the best way. Way. Well, hey, if you can make it, we'd love to see you in person next week as we celebrate those baptisms at both the 930 and the 1115 AM services. And as always, we hope you have a great week.